Welcome to the Writers' Festival. My name is Sean Wilson. I'm an artistic director. Uh, we are broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. And on behalf of the festival and our partners, Library and Archives Canada and the Ottawa Public Library, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the conversation this evening. For those who would prefer to hear this event in French, Library and Archives is offering a simultaneous translation on their YouTube channel, so you can head over there uh, and see how it sounds in the other official language. Our official bookseller is Perfect Books. Wherever you are, there is an independent bookseller nearby who would be more than happy to sell you copies, multiple copies, of the books we'll be discussing. So thank you in advance for supporting authors and booksellers through these difficult times. If you enjoy this session, visit us at writersfestival.org to make a donation, sign up for upcoming events, or to enjoy our virtual season on demand. It's as simple as pressing play to connect with some of the world's best writers. Our podcast tomorrow afternoon features Shana Lambert in conversation with Peter Schneider, Schneider and Francesca Ecuyasi in conversation with Catherine Hernandez. And our live event tomorrow night at 7.30 p.m. is the national launch of Burning Sugar by Cicely Bell Blaine, and they will be hosted by the mastermind behind VS Books, Vivek Shreya. Our host this evening is CBC Ottawa's Adrian Harewood. It's not just our two authors who are prize-winning contributors tonight. Adrian and the CBC Ottawa team recently won a Can Canadian Screen Award, so let's give him a warm virtual welcome. Well, thank you very much, Sean. Thank you very much for that, that kind introduction, and good evening. Delighted to be serving as your moderator uh, for tonight's event that we're calling Inheritance, Exploring Community, History, Belonging, and Families We Inherit and Those We Choose, uh, featuring writers Ian Williams and Kai Kello. Now, now 25 years ago this month, in, in the fall of 1995, I was part of a, a small group of uh, highly energetic and ambitious mainly 20-somethings and a few 30-somethings who organized the seminal Black Writers Conference here in Ottawa. Other organizers included the likes of the late academic and intellectual David Seeley and playwright and filmmaker Nicole Brooks. The event took place over three days at Library and Archives Canada, and it attracted a who's who of the mainly English Black Canadian literary world. Our organizing group was led by a visionary named Afua Marcus, who was dedicated to building community, but particularly Canada's Black literary community. Some of the writers included Dion Brand, Cecil Foster, Lillian Allen, Afua Cooper, Nalo Hopkinson, Clifton Joseph, Claire Harris, David Odiambo, George Elliott Clark, Danny LaFerriere, Andre Alexis, also Austin Clark, the late Austin Clark, and David Austin. A young David Cheriandi attended the conference. Uh, the acclaimed American poet, Nikki Finney, was also there. Uh, she later went on to win the National Book Award. The keynote speech was by the Grenadian intellectual and activist, Alfie Roberts. Now, other than Austin, Austin Clark and Danny LaFerriere, I would say that none of the writers really could have been considered household names in the country at the time. The conference was a celebration, but it was also a declaration, a declaration that black writers were here and needed to be recognized and respected. At the time, there was a feeling that black writers were fighting for space, fighting to be on juries, fighting to get noticed. We felt the need to be, well, to create more room in Canada's literary landscape for the voices and stories of black writers. We were operating out of a tradition ourselves. Now in the ensuing 25 years, African Canadian writing in this country has gone from strength to strength. Never before have there been so many black Canadian writers being published on an annual basis. Black writers have had some wonderful successes during that time. Austin Clark won the Giller Prize for the Polish Toe in 2002. David Austin won the Cassis de las Americas Prize for Fear of a Black Nation. Dion Brand won the Governor General's Award for Land to Light On and the Griffin for Ossuaries. Andre Alexis won the Giller, Canada Reads, and the Rogers Writers Trust Prize for 15 Dogs, and also the Wyndham Campbell Prize. Lawrence Hills, the Book of Negroes, won Canada Reads. 
and became a blockbuster and was made into an acclaimed television series. Nalo Hopkinson's published numerous books of speculative fiction to great acclaim. Essie Dugin won two Gillers for Half Blood Blues and Washington Black. And I should also mention, I think I mentioned David Cheriandi's brother won the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize. But beyond the prizes, black writers have taken their rightful space and they continue to make space and to tell their stories, to tell our stories. And we like to think that the conference that we organized over months on, on a shoestring budget, employing, employing our volunteer labor has borne fruit. And so here we are, here I am today, about to talk to two of the most acclaimed writers in our country. Tonight's conversation with Ian Williams and Kai Kello is historic. I understand that this is the first time that these literary superstars have been interviewed together. And it is most appropriate because the two are in select company in that they are both the only writers in Canadian history to have been nominated both for a Giller and a Griffin Poetry Prize. A testament to their prodigious talent, brilliance, and range. Ian Williams is a novelist and poet. His poetry collection, Personals, was shortlisted for the Griffin Poetry Prize in 2013. His short story collection, Not Anyone's Anything, won the Danuta Gleed Literary Award for the best first collection of short fiction in Canada. His first book, You Know Who You Are, was a finalist for the Relit Poetry Prize. In 2018, he became a trustee for the Griffin Poetry Prize. Ian Williams holds a PhD in English from the University of Toronto and is currently a professor of poetry at the University of British Columbia. His debut novel, Reproduction, won the 2019 Scotiabank Giller Prize. Kai Kello is a novelist, poet, and sound performer who was born in Vancouver, BC, home of the Canucks, raised in Calgary, Alberta, and in 1998, moved to Montreal, Quebec, where he now lives. And actually Montreal was where I first met Kai, and we'll maybe speak about that a little bit later. He is the author of the novel Accordion, which was a finalist for the Amazon.ca First Novel Award, two books of poetry, Latricity and Maple Leaf Rag, and two albums, Vox Versus and Creole Continuum. His latest novel, Dominoes of the Crossroads, has been long listed for the 2020 Giller Prize. And of course, he won this year's Griffin Poetry Prize. It's quite tremendous. And his new novel, of course, is called Dominoes at the Crossroads. And it gives me just great pleasure. I'm so delighted to, to welcome you both to this event. Thanks so much for joining us, Kai and Ian. It's, it's great to see the two of you. Thanks, Adrian. That's yeah. a pretty extraordinary introduction there, that contextualization. Well, 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 you two are, are pretty extraordinary people, and, and you've had you've had extraordinary years. Kyle, let let me begin with you. What kind of year has it been for you, winning this year's twenty twenty Griffin Poetry Prize? You know, the nice thing is, um, everything this year has just been a prelude to that roll call you just announced, and you tagged Ian and I on at the end of it. That was fantastic. Um, it has been a good year. Yes. What what was it like? Like when you, when you heard the news that you'd won that award. What, what were the kind of things that, that kind of went through your mind? What, what did you think of initially? Um, a wave of relief, to tell you the truth. That was probably the strongest thing. Um, it was a, yeah, it was a wave of relief, largely because um, to, it's so rare to receive that level of recognition. And, um, you know, the, the, the anticipation combined with the desire and the tension and the uncertainty, um, you can't not think about that. It just, it, it takes up residence inside you. And so there was a sense of relief, but for that reason, relief from the tension of the moment, but there was also a sense of relief because as an artist, it's just rare to receive that kind of recognition. So it was um, uh, nice to, to get the signal that what you're doing is is of of some value to the public, and that um, uh, that you you ought to probably continue doing it. 
has it changed you? Is Kai Kello a different person today than he was winning the Griffin Poetry Prize? And, and I ask that because sometimes when we get that kind of recognition, it gives us a certain kind of affirmation. And, and I'm wondering, it, it can give us a certain kind of confidence. Has it changed you in any way? Uh, I, I kind of think I'm too old for that to happen in a way because I didn't receive, but I, I was really, pri literary prize culture was really, um, so I was very peripheral to that, that entire entity um, until I was in my 40s, until I was 41 or 42, when I got a first nomination for Accordéon novel. And I had been really oblivious to it up to that point. I'd spent a lot of time concentrating on the oral tradition, working with um, instrumentalists, working with music. And um, although I had written some poetry, I... I never really concentrated on, I remember being at a party once um, and talking to a group of poets and half like, you know, deep into a bottle of wine. And we were talking about the poet Kamau Brathwaite. And, and I was like, oh yeah, I think he won the Giller prize for poetry. I mean, you know, I was that gauche in a way, like I wasn't, wasn't really aware of, of literary prize culture until with, about a few years ago. Um, so, you know, if you're still writing and still writing poetry and still writing novels by the time you're in your 40s, um, um, you must have, you likely have a deep love um, for that process of writing and for the writing life. And um, I don't think that, a, that, that prizes can necessarily change you or change your relationship to what you do. Ian, I would imagine you weren't oblivious to, to prize culture Mm. Uh, when, when you won the the the, the, the when, you, when you won the Giller last right. year, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm getting confused here. The Giller <laughs> last year in in, in 2019. I, I'm wondering what what did winning that award do for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's odd because um, uh, I write both poetry and fiction, and so I swing between these two identities, right? So uh, when I was nominated for the Griffin, it's like Ian Williams, Canadian poet. Um, and for a first novel, there were uh, many more established novelists on the, on the list. And so to have that identity undulate between like poet and fiction writer, poet, fiction writer, now he's a novelist. Now, I don't know, he's choreographing ballet performances or something. Um, there's a bit of, um, I, I think there's a little bit of a desire to kind of have a stable identity, right? To say, uh, this author is a poet and we can expect to get this out of him. Um, but that said, I mean, I, I feel free as a writer and a thinker to swing away and to write in whatever forms kind of appeal to me. Um, the feeling though, it's, it's interesting to listen to Kai talk through this um, because it's, it does kind of shift something inside of you, but it doesn't shift the things that are difficult to do, which is like the writing itself, right? Um, it shifts the kind of reception and, and how people think and treat you. Um, and a kind of mythology that builds up in people's heads about what you're about. Uh, but there's still the dailiness of writing and the dailiness of, of living that is outside of the prize and the prize culture and all of that. So you're saying it, it hasn't changed your writing life necessarily. It hasn't changed your core self, but you, you suggested there, you alluded to the fact that it's changed the way people treat you. Is that, or some people treat you. How yeah. do pe people treat you now? Well, I, I wonder, Adrian, if I would be here if I didn't win the Giller, though, right? You know, there's this kind of visibility to be perfectly frank about, about things. Well, I talked to of... you. I, I talked to you. <laughs> I, we, no. we, we had an interview. We, we had a pretty long interview. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I, I, this is, you, this you, is even no... came over, you even came over to my house for a party <laughs> I know. afterwards. I remember. I remember the standing around your kitchen and stuff. No, this is no shade whatsoever. Um, but it's, it's kind of typical that, without a doubt, opportunities open up as a result of these things. I mean, that's... Um, undeniable. And uh, I, I don't want to be, on one hand, I don't want to be cynical about it. And on the other hand, I don't want to buy into it too much. This idea that um, I was destined to win this from my birth in 1979, um, it could have happened to anybody. Um, so there's a bit of, of yes, effort and, and skill and all of that. And there's a bit of luck in these things. And to kind of remember that dynamic, to say that um, this year it worked out for you, but there were several years, a decade, um, when it didn't quite, right? Um, so to keep that in check, right? Uh, and not sort of fall into the 
delusion that I am somehow better. <laughs> I am better because people treat me better. Mm. It's a pretty auspicious debut though that you had at a novelist. And I'm wondering, where do you go from here? Like, like once, you know, once, once you win Downhill the Downhill is what you're suggesting. Well, what, well, what, what, once you win the Giller the first time out, you know, like, do, do you feel, do you, but the, the serious question is, is there pressure now? Like, did you, mm. is the pressure on for that second novel right. that has to kind yeah. of reach those heights? I, I, I don't feel it. And I mean, uh, there's no external pressure that's worse than the pressure that I place on myself, right? Um, so I feel like the next thing that I do will be, uh, right now I'm writing essays. I'm writing towards um, a nonfiction uh, collection and it's given me like incredible pleasure and it's incredibly difficult, but really satisfying. So um, I, I'm not too worried about sort of external expectations. Uh, I know what I would like to do going forward and I know I'm going to take chances and hopefully they do pay off. I mean, I'm not going to send anything into the world until I um, feel pretty secure about it. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to court a particular kind of uh, like star career or something. I just want to do good work and think about the things that I've been thinking about for a while. Kai, you are the first person in history. And, and I know this because I checked, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're the, I fact checked. You're, you're, the, you're the first person in Canadian history to be nominated both for a Griffin Poetry Prize and a Giller Prize in the same year. You know, it, it's, it's, it's quite extraordinary. And I'm wondering, you know, you, you, you say that, that you've been somewhat outside of the kind of award culture, but, but again, you know, you're a human being. Does that put pressure on you? Like, are, are you already thinking about the next book that you have to write that has to reach that standard? The standards that you've, you know, you've set for yourself? Um, there's pressure. There's definitely pressure. I mean, I t I t after the Griffin win, I chatted with, chatted with Dion briefly and she said um uh she just dropped this hint but it fell like with the weight of like an anvil it was like you know i've heard you talk about some projects that you're interested in but i haven't heard you say anything about poetry you should think about poetry in the next couple of years and then i kind of realized later that it was it was i might have been less of a hint and more of a of a of a of a forceful suggestion um a strong yeah. nudge by Dion brand yeah <laughs> and you can't refuse that nudge so so <laughs> i started writing some i started in on um some new poems a, a new long poem and i reached a point of about 22 23 pages and then i decided to put it down for a little while but the pressure i mean it, it was it was uh, productive um but in truth, I would I would agree with Ian. I would feel that the same, the essential pressure and the important pressure and the most intense pressure comes. It's it's a kind of internal pressure uh, that you put on yourself. Um, and large, you know, I really don't know what people expect um, or what what expectations might be or what other kind of external pressure there might be because I've written books that are. Um, I guess I'm not, I haven't, I haven't necessarily, like it's, it's the kind of fiction and poetry that I'm writing is, 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 um, you know, I'm not writing um, like, like a blockbuster spy novel or something, although that would be fantastic. Um, so it's not necessarily the kind of fiction that comes with these really high market expectations. Um, so, uh, you know, that kind of expectation is also not there. Um, it's just an internal and personal pressure. And do the two of you have, I don't know, a plan, a kind of a five-year plan, an agenda for the next couple of years? Like, do you set about saying, or, or do you say, for example, you know, now I'm going to write poetry. Now I'm going to write a novel. You know, Ian, you said you're writing uh, essays right yeah. now. I, is that just because you felt like writing it? Or, or was this something that you would kind of set out in some kind of schedule? Mm -hmm. No, I knew I would write them at some point in my life. I just didn't think they would be uh, right now. But the essays emerge out of sort of the urgency of, of uh, race relations and social dynamics of our moment. And so um, I, I was working on a novel, I still am, but I couldn't quite go forward with that because this these essays really interrupted that thinking and that process. So I need to complete this before I can move forward. Um, and these are the kinds of things that maybe I, I, I'm not sure. I think when white writers get interrupted by uh, 
a new artistic project, it has that kind of, um, uh, what is it? It has a different kind of impetus than what I'm feeling right now, right? I feel like um, I'm not detouring into nonfiction because it's uh, solely an artistic choice or a source of pleasure, but there's an absolute need to do this, to sort of clear this path before I can write fiction again. So, but I, I can see the next novel, I can see this book of essays, um, and that's as far as I can see right now. And, and, and Kai, for you, do, do you have a, do you have a two-year plan, a, a one-year plan, a 10-year plan when it comes to, you know, the kinds of projects you want to complete? Um, I have some projects in my head. Um, and I, I usually, actually, I go, um, I do, I do kind of prepare five-year plans. Um, and, but right now, um, I'm uh, in the rehearsal studio with um, some instruments and some visual projections, and we're going to be doing a an audio video recording at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto next week. Um, with I sometimes collaborate with the bass saxophonist and um, elect, uh, electronic musician Jason Sharp. If any of you are interested in some really really good music, uh, check out the Constellation label uh, and Jason Sharp. He has a couple of records there. So I've been wanting to take a, another detour into sound for a while, and um, uh, so that's definitely a priority right now. That's on the front burner. But I do, I do feel some, you know, some pressure to, um, as Ian said, in a way, respond to the moment. Um, but right now, I don't know what form that's going to come in. Uh, I think, you know, for 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 artists, it can come in so many different forms. It can come in 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 poetry. Um, it can come in uh, fiction. Um, it can come, it could be nonfiction. For me, I'm, I'm really not sure. This is one of those exceptional moments in the world though, where I feel like I need to watch the world and I need to be attuned to what's going on in the world and think about it and feel what's going on because um, there's so many developments that have shifted um, the way we look at how we exist in the world and how we relate to one another and what even what the idea of the future is, how we relate to the idea of the future. Um, we have so many things, climate, climate crisis on the horizon, race relations, um, you know, it's it, a, a global pandemic that seems to be renewing itself. So in a sense, I'm, um, these are unusual and unprecedented times. And sometimes as a writer, one needs a bit of silence um, or a, a, a bit of distance from um, having one's head sort of within the confines of a work. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I need at this moment. Um, you know, of course, I want to talk about your, your books. I want to talk about your, your fiction. But, but, but the both of you have addressed it. And so I think we, we should go there. Let, let's talk a little bit about this particular moment, this moment in time, this moment you know, in the, the, the age of, of COVID-19, the age of Black Lives matter you know when we think about the, the 60s often we, we think about writers and, and we think you know we often think about someone like a James Baldwin and, and and the kind of particular role that Baldwin played at a critical moment particularly in U.S. history I, I'm wondering if the role of the writer over the decades in the culture in the society has changed and 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 if so you know Ian what do you see as your particular responsibility as a black writer to address this moment. Yeah, I, I think one uh, deterrent is the idea that I'm writing only for this moment. Um, and I think what's really brilliant about James Baldwin is that he seems to occupy no time, right? He seems to actually be writing from our moment right now and not from the 60s um, or 70s. And so to have that kind of nearly prophetic insight. I think it's what Kai's saying about um, needing to step back and be in touch with the world and attuned, I think that was your word, attuned to it in such a way that you could sort of um, see the, uh, the underground stream, right? Rather than just what's happening on the surface. Um, and to be able to speak to that, that requires an extraordinary gift and an extraordinary perceptive quality that, um, can't be rushed to get a book out, say, for next year, or it can't be, you know, hurried. Uh, it requires really sort of tapping into both the moment and yourself, 
and the vibrations between these things. So um, as a writer, I'm, I'm not super, uh, I'm not obsessed with representing this time. You know, it's, it's not my job to kind of uh, chronicle this time in particular, but I think there's something about the dynamic in how humans relate in a much larger way that will be important now and in 2040 um, and would have been important in the 1990s, right? So I, I think I'm just looking at time a little bit differently. So, but let me ask you directly, because, because yeah. you did say that you did feel the impetus to, to, do. to, do, to do something, to, to, to mm -hmm. act in some kind of way. What are you seeing and, and what needs to be said? Mm -hmm. huh. Wow. You know, so many people are saying, this is it, right? So I feel like I can't say just one thing on the subject of Black Lives Matter. I think people, it, it's really, it's impossible to give a kind of snappy, succinct answer about how complex this issue is right now. Um, so I love it when we can hear Tana Hesse Coates and we can see Claudia Rankin approaching this differently. Um, and I actually think there needs to be like multiple kinds of angles on this issue. So some people write very personally about this. Here's my biography, it kind of reads as memoir. Other people just kind of stay in their heads. Other people like theorize really explicitly a kind of sociological thing. Um, but the cast of our minds as writers um, is not overrun by a genre. And by that, I mean, um, uh, I write fiction and I write poetry right now, but that is not necessarily the only way I can respond to this moment. And so to be free and to be liberated enough to say as a human being, um, how do I think about this and how can I represent that thought and what angle does that thought um, bring to this conversation. That's what I'm trying to do. This is the, the difficult thing about, I, I know I'm sort of talking kind of abstractly here to you, Adrian, but the difficult thing um, is not really novelty, is not saying something new about all of this all, but actually positioning the self like this kind of on this chessboard and moving, where do I need to be? And what do I see from my position here that, you know, Toni Morrison, uh, didn't see from her position over there, although we're both on the same plane here, right, of uh, the same vantage. So, yeah, I, I want unique perspectives here. I want each individual story to say, what's it like to be Guyanese at this moment and African-American and born in Toronto and all of these perspectives. I want to see those things emerge. Mm -hmm. Kai, you, you were alluding to the fact that you too feel the need to, to intervene in, in a particular way in this moment and, and to intervene politically? Well, I've always felt that need to intervene. I mean, uh, I would, I, I think I would draw, take that, trace that instinct back to um, listening to dub poets. I mean, a dub poets performance is, a, is, a, is an intervention into the culture, into the cultural space, into, um, you know, how we look at ourselves, whether we think we're beautiful, uh, what's going on in our immediate environment and in global politics. Um, it's an intervention into um, our, our perceptions and our biases and our, our prejudices. Um, and I think that that is one uh, approach to writing that is certainly not the only approach I take, but it's one approach that is very dear to me. Um, and I guess I do in a way like the adversarial nature of it because I uh, grew up in a time where there was a total dearth of representation um, of different types of Black um, existence here in Canada. I mean, as a Black writer, mixed race Black writer from the prairies, um, you know, you saw so few, I mean, the possibility that you might one day become a writer, capital W, was just remote, right? Um, and there were so f few, um, in, even in popular culture, so few possible selves that you could become. So I feel that my entire arts life has been an intervention into that um, set of limitations, um, whether that's in uh, you know, oral poetry or writing literary poetry or fiction. Um, the point is the political act is presence and that presence is an intervention into um, um, some of those limitations. And, 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 and you, know, you yourself appear I mean, me, I, myself, 
um, you, when you appear publicly, you are a possibility. Um, and so that's often how, that thought often kind of recurs to me. And one of the reasons too that it does is, you know, earlier at the beginning of the, of the, of the broadcast, you mentioned a number of different writers. And when I encountered each one of those writers, um, that opened a door for me, a, a possible self that I could become, um, something that I could do, a way I could. I was talking to one of your colleagues this morning, Nantali Ndongo, mm -hmm. uh, in CBC Montreal. And we were talking about Dion's writing. And, I, and I, one of her, the first books of hers that I encountered was Bread Out of Stone. And it was sort of the lyric essay. I'd never read, I was pretty young. I'd never read a lyric essay before. And it just, I, I didn't know, it, it struck me aesthetically as so such an incredible piece of writing because it was beautiful. It had this poetic language in it, but then it had this you know, political hard talk that would come in. And um, you know, it was just a remarkable work. And so each one of those writers coming across and reading their work and thinking about it opened up a different, um, set of possibilities for the artist that I could be, the person I could be, how I could exist in the world. Um, and uh, um, that's what I think of as a major and crucial function of the arts, especially as a Black artist. Mm -hmm. You referenced dub poetry and, and intervening. And I was thinking, I think it was an LKJ, what is it, independent intervention? Isn't that it? I believe so. I believe so. I believe so. L let's talk a little bit about inheritance, uh, because Kai, you, you, you mentioned the roll call uh, that I, I read out uh, in the introduction. You know, some of those, those, those Black Canadian writers who attended that, that conference in, in 1995. I, I want you to talk, and you, you, you just mentioned Dion Brand and, and the, the, Im the impact, the influence that, that uh, her book, Brett, it's Brennan of Stone. Brennan of Stone. Uh, yeah, um, from 1990, was it 1990, 1998? Was that it? I'm, I'm forgetting what year that was. You know, I think it was like a coach, was it maybe a coach house edition that came out first and then okay. the NS edition? I'm not right. sure. Right. But I want you to talk about what you see as being your inheritance when it comes to, to the African Canadian literature and, and the kinds of, 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 of stories and storytellers that, that have helped to, to form you. Oh, I mean, there's so many different angles that one can take on inheritance because you inherit so many different things from so many different um, milieus, you know. Um, I, yeah, I, I learned, I, the dub poets were very generous and very kind to me and writers like Dion, Marlene Norbisi Philip, uh, a lot of Canadian, brilliant Caribbean Canadian writers have been very, very kind and generous with me. And um, I think that sense of, of, of intervention is one thing that I have um, inherited from them, in particular from Lillian Allen, because um, I, what, one of the things that I admire so much about Lillian is that sense that um, she was going to, and, and poets like Clifton Joseph and Afua Cooper, that they were going to come and um, make their voice heard in a milieu in which their voice their accent, their voice, their self was not um, so commonly heard and might in fact not be welcome. And they weren't going to try to adapt their voice so that it would sound like the voice that was more commonly heard. They were going to come and bring their own voice. And because that gesture um, is something that uh, is a big part of my own inheritance. Is that your voice and your own experience are valid because they're yours, um, and that's 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 one of the most important uh, things. In fact, ideas that I've inherited from um, uh, that generation of writers and poets. Ian, can can you speak to to, to your inheritance? You know what what you regard as being some of the some of the, 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 the writers and writing that, that has, has fed you yeah. uh, over think, the years? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Adrian. And I think uh, I run into the same problem that many writers have, many writers of color have, which is that your inheritance um, has been interrupted and you have been fostered instead by white writers and a white tradition 
um, in white institutions. Um, so the people that um, I read through during my undergrad and my graduate studies, uh, you know, were largely white folks and the folks in the library in Brampton Public Library that I could get my hands on um, were white folks. So I'm grateful for my contemporaries uh, right now. Um, but just as I, it's the same feeling I'm having right now, Adrian, like when I got my DNA results from, you know, um, Ancestry 23 or whatever, and you look back and you see, oh, whoa, I can't quite, <laughs> I can't trace anything here, right? Yeah, so I'm 25% this and 25% that and 10% this. Um, and you look back and you realize that your line lineage has been interrupted in such a way that it's hard to recover beyond a generation, right? Or maybe two. Um, and there's a kind of like mourning for that. So uh, the people that I read, the people that I read um, sadly could not regard me as, the people that I read did not really engage race, you know? Um, and therefore I couldn't do it or I had to do it on my own or I couldn't do it through their example. And so if I think about uh, my primary sort of reading as a, as a teenager and stuff, you know, there's a lot of Atwood growing up in my teens and then Toni Morrison came a little bit later and so fostered by these really um, brilliant women um, and put together, they were able to cobble together a kind of literary imaginary for me. Um, but individually, I, I needed different things from different people. Mm -hmm. Can I say this? You know, what, one thing that I find particularly thrilling mm -hmm. about reading both of you is that you feel free. <laughs> right? the, 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 two, the two of you both seem free. You, you feel, you seem untethered. You, you seem as if you're not necessarily beholden to any particular tradition necessarily. You, you seem to be your own people and you're saying the things that you want to say without the kind of restrictions that a certain kind of gaze can sometimes put on you. And, and Kai, I'm wondering, you know, this is my question for you. How did you become so free? <laughs> That's a fantastic question. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> How did I become so free? Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I didn't study in uh, creative writing programs. So one th thing that I can say is that um, I've really had to, 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 to work to adapt techniques from other art forms to literary techniques, right? Like when you listen to music and you listen to musical compositional techniques like a crescendo or like um, a held elongated note um, and how it functions in a particular part of a work. Um, uh, you know, you think about those structural um, things and you, you, I've had to think of ways in which they can be duplicated um, in or interpreted in literary works, like in a poem or in a piece of fiction, or you notice things in in uh, in, in painting, things that, that different painters will do, different techniques that they will use, and you know you think about how those those techniques could potentially work in a poem. Um, so I think I've had to do a lot of searching um, and attempt a lot of interpretation and um, transposition um, in order to learn how to teach myself how to write. And so I've tried to take uh, an approach that, um, that, that stores up different techniques in my memory and, 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 and uses them in a way that, that I hope is going to work well. Uh, but I'm, I don't feel myself as a result beholden necessarily to any, um, any particular trends. Um, although I know the traditions that I'm informed by, um, that's, why there may be the illusion of a lot of freedom. Ian, yourself, how, how did you yeah. become so free? And Ian, I'm, I'm gonna cite an example of how I think you're free mm -hmm. uh, because there, there, there's, a, there's a word that you use in uh, reproduction and it shocked me that you used it without even that? translating it and it's chups. <laughs> right? You, 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 use the, you use the word chups. Right, right, right. Right, right. And, and I'm, and I, right you say chups, I say chups. Yeah. All right? <laughs> right. right? And it's sucking, it's a sucking of your teeth. 
That's right. right. To, to, That's to indicate right. a certain kind of contempt or, or, or yes. disdain. Now, right. a lot of people would feel the need to translate that, right? right? right. Because you're, you're thinking about your audience and you're thinking about that, that a part of your audience wouldn't understand that. Right. You didn't translate it. You just no. used the word. It's and, such and an extreme. <laughs> Thank you for that, Adrian. I mean, it's such an expressive gesture, right? That, that sort of sucking of the teeth. And it can mean many, many kinds of things, dismissal and, you know, all these kinds of indications in there. Um, but that showed but, me that you were liberated in a certain yeah, kind of way. Absolutely. And, you know, the moments that I feel tension in racial conversations um, are the moments when I feel that it's being foisted on me that blackness is a kind of strangeness, right? That to be me is a kind of strange phenomenon. When my experience of just waking up in the morning and going through my life, brushing my teeth and doing all of those things um, is not strange, right? Um, so I guess part of my big sort of life project is not to, uh, not to prove that, you know, as black folks, we are human, right? I think when you do, when you get into that mode that black people are human, that kind of really basic and reductive proof, then the explaining and stuff starts to happen. Then it has, look, this corresponds to that, therefore they are human. Um, but if you take the approach that um, I, am, uh, I am me and this strange kind of covering that is applied on me is really the thing that we need to look at or, or interrogate. And I'm gonna do this sort of as freely as I can. Um, the problem is not me or my humanity. Um, the problem is the coding <laughs> of me coding like computer coding and coding as well as this layer that's being applied to me and i i resist that layer right even in in, in conversation and assumptions about me um there's nothing strange about being black there's nothing strange about about me here talking like this yeah you know both of you are are you know you write prose and, and you also write poetry and, and kai I'm, I'm wondering how do the lessons that you learned from poetry inform your prose? And, and has, your, has, has your, your embrace, your, your immersion in poetry allowed you to be free as a prose writer? Um, that's a question that I thought about a lot with these two books. Um, Magnetic Equator and Dominoes at the Crossroads were written at the same time. They were basically written, like I like to say they were written with, in the same breath. Um, so they were part of the same inspiration. And um, I basically had a very similar deadline for dominoes that was eventually extended. But what would happen is I would write for like roughly two weeks on one work in one form, say poetry. And then I would need to, a week to pull my head out of that kind of thinking and put it back into a, a new mode, which was the fictional mode. And that would go for two weeks. And then I was like, okay, now I need to go back and, and, and work further toward the deadline on the poetry. And so it would be in these kind of five week cycles that I would work on both of them. And what happened was that um, the sentence migrated into the poetry and so did a sense of narrative. So did the fragments of narrative and pieces of narrative um, whereas the poetry um, didn't migrate as much into the fiction. Uh, in, I think there was more resistance there uh, toward allowing certain poetic techniques and liberties to enter into the fiction. Because in fiction, you have to be very pragmatic in some ways. You have to be very, very, very um, thoughtful about time, about sequences of events and temporal sequences and, and, and setting and character and you can't take as many liberties with leaps in time and place and um, as you can in a way in poetry. Well, you can, but then it's a different kind of fiction altogether. It's more difficult to um, engage with. Uh, but I think that writing the fictional impulse had more of an impact on how my poetry was developing. Um, and the poetry, one of the things that, that, that appeared in it was this sort of um, broken sentences right? Like the sentences would begin and there would be like a gap in the sentence. Um, and then it would continue a little bit later. There would be a missing thought or uh, 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 something would be elided or, or jumped over. Um, and yeah, but, but I don't, 
But in terms of how those relate to freedom, um, I think, I guess the, the two forms, I allowed them the freedom to speak to one another and to develop a relationship with one another and discuss what they would share with each other. You know, the one thing that I, I, I want to get, get to Ian on the same question, but the, the, the one thing that I found about you were writing, Kai, and also your writing, Ian, is there, there's this interesting tension because on the one hand, th there's an economy about your writing, right? There, there's a kind of, there, there's a precision about your writing, uh, but there's also an insouciance as well. The, 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 and, and, it, and you manage, I don't know how you manage to do it. But, you know, that's the magic, I suppose, of writing, right? But, but it, 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 every word carries a punch and yet it doesn't seem as if you are restricting yourself in any kind of way, Kai. Uh, you know, I can really speak more clearly to Magnetic Equator because I think it's a book that I understand more as a poet. That's a kind of a book that, um, it was really, really draws up from um, my own experience and personal histories and um, family histories. Um, and the language was a focus. The language is on the surface there also because it's poetry. So something has to be happening at the level of language. And um, it draws a lot from um, some favorite poets from the Caribbean who, um, who, who work at the level of language in a way that, that language becomes the battleground in a way. The, the, like who? Kemal Brathwaite, um, uh, you know, Kemal Brathwaite, um, Marlene Nubisi Philip, definitely, uh, who, uh, Grace Nichols, um, um, uh, Derek Walcott, of course, um, but the language itself is where different social registers come in to argue out what kind of language is going to be the predominant language in the work. How are we going to talk about ourselves and our, our experience? How are we going to voice that? Um, and so in that book, uh, the language is really, um, I'm, the language is, is quite, uh, it's the focus. Ian, how, how, how did poetry inform your prose? How, how has your prose informed your poetry? Yeah, there's a kind of reciprocity between the two of them. Uh, I mean, I'm a very sort of languagey person, right? So in this conversation, when Kai said attuned, I was like, that's such a great word. It just feels great, attuned. Um, yeah, and what was it you said? Insouciance a, a second ago. And I was like, that's a... That's, you know, a $10 word that he just brought out there. Um, so I'm always like listening for these things, right? I'm always sort of um, listening to it. And I think because of, um, because of who we are, we're always like attuned to the social situation that we're in. Um, so language for me is that really important um, sort of detector. It's really important for me to listen carefully to what people are saying in order to stay safe, in order to position myself in a conversation and whatnot. I mean, I've been doing this from the time I was a kid, right? And I suspect um, that a lot of, like, I suspect a lot of black kids have that affinity to detect register and tone and subtext and know when they're welcome and where, and um, where are we pitching this conversation and what can I get away with and all of that. I mean, very sophisticated, but in our not articulated ways. Um, so I have a real sort of pleasure for like the, just the gymnasium of language, right? And all the possibilities it affords me. Um, and I don't sort of draw the hard line between poetry and fiction. I sort of move, um, uh, I keep that delight in language active in whether I'm writing poetry or fiction. There are things I need to satisfy in fiction. You know, you need, the story needs to move forward. It can't just be all play and fun. Um, and in poetry, there are other things that need to be satisfied. Um, but my basic material, right? The matter, the ingredients that I choose for my food are tend to be um, well selected. I'm very careful about where I buy my food. And yet, it, it seemed to, to me, for, for both of you, that that you know, one thing that, that really jumps out is 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 how you structure your story and stories, how you structure reproduction, you know, how you structure you know, dominoes at the crossroads, Kai. Um, you know, the, the, the one thing that, 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 that I noticed was, was that there, there doesn't seem to be, um, your, your books are both kind of genre-less, 
if, mm. if I could use that. It, it, it's almost as if you've invented a new way of writing a story. Uh, and, and I'm wondering, you know, Ian, for you, how the, the structure of reproduction came about. Uh, mm. be, because, it, because it's not conventional. No, no, not at all. Um, yeah, I won't spell it out in, in, in detail, but pretty much the book does reproduce in a number of ways, mathematical and biological, and then um, hell breaks loose and it becomes cancerous in the last section. Um, and for me, that's, that's great pleasure, right? I think there should be an aesthetic kind of reckoning that a reader has when he approaches a, a text, a work of mm -hmm. art, um, so that it's not just all story and information and just grabbing, grabbing material like that, but there's a kind of... Um, uh, delicacy of touch, right? It's not just, here's a glob of blue paint on this canvas, right? But there's something about arrangement and brushstroke and, and those things. So I'm really sort of careful about structure. Um, I don't want to sort of wax philosophical about the importance of structure, right? Um, but uh, I have, I think, somewhat successfully navigated a number of structures. And in order to do that, um, I've had to understand how they work. Um, and so part of just my imagination and how my brain works is what is the structure here? How does it behave and how can it be manipulated? Mm -hmm. How did you approach structure, Kai, in Dominos at the Crossroads? Was that something that you were, you were thinking about from the outset? It was because um, the short story is such a compressed format uh, that you need, um, you need to, you need to, a lot of things have to happen in a very short frame. And I was, I think I was trying to write uh, at the intersection of um, forms that I like. I was trying to write kind of at the intersection of memoir, of um, at the essay, but to have that under the general broad umbrella of fiction um, and, to, and to have a bit of a ragged edge with that so that, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily clear when um, memoir left off and the essay began or the fiction took over, but they would, that they would start to converse with one another again and that they would start to um, blur one another and blur into one another. Um, and I was enjoying very much playing with the idea of, of, of kind of, you know, coming of age memoirs in a couple of the stories and um, looking back over a certain passage in a person's life, a person looking back uh, at a passage in their own life and setting up a story as a reminiscence, as a kind of, uh, um, you know, a, 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 a functioning of memory, but then it blurring when that memory becomes fictionalized. Um, but I mean, I think a lot, I think drawing this from music, I think a lot about um, improvisation and um, what that means, what, it, what, what, it, what improvisation means in the context of music and what it could potentially mean in, in a written context. And um, I want there to be the appearance of some kind of spontaneity or improvisation um, in a work that has been, of course, worked over very meticulously in order to produce that illusion. Mm -hmm. And that was important in both dominoes, but also in um, magnetic equator. Kai, in your writing, I, I often get a sense that you're very much aware of history. You're, you're very much rooted in history and, and that you're kind of walking in the footsteps of the ancestors. And, and, and that, that certainly, you know, came across in, in, in one of your short stories in Dominoes of the Crossroads, where I believe it, 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 it was a Marie-Joseph Angelique type character. It was, it was an enslaved person who is escaping from their master in Montreal in the 18th century. And, and you, you shift from a, a character who's in the present to this character in the 18th century. And, and you kind of go back and forth uh, throughout the throughout that story, so I, I want you to, to to address that idea of kind of walking in the footsteps of ancestors and, and why that's so important to you. Um, I think you know I I don't know what Ian would think of this idea or what you would think of this idea, but it 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 kind of haunts me and this idea that as a black uh, person in North America in the diaspora, 
that you're always in a way reckoning with your history. You have to bring your total history to bear on the moment often and on, and often your history in a particular place is not represented. And you wind up having to bring the entire history of the Americas to bear on this moment so that you can construct yourself into enough of a complete human being to perform the tasks that you need to perform in daily life. And it's that sense of, of in a way, you know, so many people I've, that I've known have, have had that sort of historical consciousness and historical awareness. We're just talking about, you mentioned Dave Austin earlier. And Dave Austin has been a sort of guardian of the history of um, the Sir George Williams affair, the, um, the uh, computer center occupation in 1969 in Montreal. Um, so there's that, but there's also coming from a, growing up in a place like Alberta where the, there is black history there certainly, um, and there are black writers there. Um, and there, there's a lineage of that, but it's different. It takes on different proportions and a different kind of depth when you're in, um, uh, Montreal um, or on the East Coast. And that sense of actually having a Black history in a particular place is remarkable, right? Um, so coming to Montreal and learning about something like the 1969 Computer Center occupation um, at what is now Concordia, that was really remarkable. That was a watershed kind of moment for me. It was a, a moment of, of of realizing that you have a lineage of, of Black Caribbean radicalism and student activism here. It's part of your history. And it makes it made me walk a little taller. Um, um. And, and it's something that you, you seem to want to share it, because there, there's sometimes at times, and, and it's not that it's didactic, right? But, but there's a kind of a pedagogical dimension uh, to, that, that's kind of inserted, I would say, in some of the stories where you're reminding us that of, of the presence of black folks, particularly in a space like Quebec in Canada. It's possible. I mean, that, that could very well be a shortcoming in the writing. Um, but uh, no, I, I did want to, I, I was thinking about, and I do still often think about this, which is having that, that um, I guess opening up a space in the writing that's like an epic kind of scope, right? So all history is present in the moment, suddenly. Um, and you can, your characters can move into and out of it and can think through historical episodes and those can, can, can drift through the present um, and shift the consciousness of the characters and shift the movement of a narrative um, and potentially have an impact on, on the present moment. Um, but, but that's that opening up that kind of space. I mean, that's suddenly what happens sometimes in music, right? Like you listen to a particular type of music from a certain moment and you're transported there, but you remain in the present. Um, or you listen to someone who makes, as they're playing a reference to a song from, uh, you know, say you're listening to an improvising jazz musician and they make a reference to a song from the 1970s or the 1960s and you get, uh, further transported. And so I love the way that functions uh, in music. And I've, I've always wanted to be able to, to make that kind of um, those illusions and those, those references in writing. You know, music plays a very important role uh, and, and clearly is a big influence on, on the two of you. And Ian, I, I must thank you uh, for allowing me to be nostalgic uh, for the, the, the 1990s. <laughs> 1990s, because, because you know, in, in particular, there was one point where I think you mentioned that song, La Da Dee Da Da. Da, da, da. <laughs> right. What was it? The, the D, Gypsy, was it D woman. Gypsy, Gypsy Woman. Gypsy Woman. That was it. Gypsy, 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 Gypsy Woman. <laughs> Gypsy, Gypsy, Gypsy Woman. You know, and, and there were a number. There were a number of other. You know, you you reference Madonna, and you you, right. you you reference all kinds of you you want reference all kinds of folks. What role does music play for you right. in the process of your writing? Yeah, I like what Kai said there um, about sort of being transported to a different time or whatever. But it's a kind of shorthand, right? It's a kind of emotional shorthand. If I sing to you, groove is in the heart, um, then you kind of remember it's suddenly sunny and there's like a psychedelic video and you're watching much music and mm. Erica M is hosting. And it, it's a really, really efficient shorthand. There's something very poetic about, about the right illusion and the right reference. And so I find music doing this all the time. I will begin a sentence and then the completion of that sentence is, you know, a part of a song, the lyrics of a chorus or whatever. And so to um, insert those things 
in the right moments, I think is important because that's our shared, you know, that's our shared culture too, right? Um, it's a shared, shared reference base for sure, but it's also a shared time. Um, and although I might not have been doing exactly what you were doing um, in 1994 when Kurt Cobain died, um, we both remember the moment, right? So yeah, it's important to have that sort of common, common reference among us. Mm -hmm. what, what, what does audience mean to you, Ian? And, and, and are you thinking about audience when you're writing? Does, does audience matter? Yeah, I do think about the audience quite a lot, um, but it's not imposing, right? So I do have uh, readers in mind, but they're a benevolent force in all of this, right? They're, they're kind and they're smiling and they're right there with me and they're kind of chuckling along. Um, so I, I don't, the audience as a concept doesn't really, you know, bother me or, or stall my writing. Um, I believe that they want the best for this project too. Um, and I think that translates, right? When you, um, from the beginning, speak to somebody with the, speak to somebody as, because you already like them and because you already can speak kind of familiarly with them. Um, that takes care of voice and tone issues from the get-go. And audience, what, what does audience mean to you, Kai? Um, I really like that uh, perspective that Ian just shared, which is when you speak to someone that you, you like and you want to be in conversation with. Um, I, yeah, I think that that's a great idea. Um, I should, I'm going to adopt that approach uh, in my next work. Uh, but I do definitely think about audience. You think about, I mean, I think about them on a, a number of levels. Like, how will they receive this? Like, how will this be understood? Will it seem hostile? Will it seem um, uh, engaging? Will it seem difficult? Will it seem, you know, is, is what I want to be clear actually clear? And I think about audience a lot on that level, on the level of clarity. Like, is it clear? Like, is will somebody else who is not me understand what's going on, or is this cryptic? Um, and that's 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 often where I I think about audience and about about that relationship between wanting to actually um, uh, play along that continuum between that to sort of moves between something that's clear and intelligible and noise and. And um, you know, knowing where you are on that continuum at all times, and knowing where the 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 reader is. Mm -hmm. we, we have an interesting question that, that's coming from the, our audience here. But but before I get to that, I, I just wanted to note that, that the two of you are kind of you, you can your your studies in a, there, there's a certain kind of contrast between your um, your movements, let's say, over, over the last 20 years. B because in many, you know, Kai really since what, the 1990s, you've been rooted in one place, in that you've been rooted in Montreal. Mon Montreal has become home for you. Um, Ian, you've had a, a bit more of a kind of a peripatetic kind of lifestyle in that you've moved, you've moved around to many different places. Um, Paul Barrett here asks this question. He says, I'd like to know how each of you think about the places that you write about. Kai alluded to Brathwaite, his inscription of place is always informed by elsewhere, by, by diaspora and the difficult exchanges of black modernity. Do you see the cultural force of diaspora at work in the places you're writing about in Canada? If so, can you say about how you see them happening in Brampton, Montreal and elsewhere? So, so Kai, perhaps I'll, I'll begin with you, that, that question from Paul Barrett. Uh, thanks for that question, Paul. Uh, that's a great question. Um, it's a difficult question, so I don't know if I'll do it justice. Um, but um, I've tried to write with these two books in a, in a way that uh, undercuts place or has place always in, it's about place, but each place is either written about from a distance, from an elsewhere, or the action is situated in a place other than where it's being talked about from. Or in the case of poetry, where one place kind of becomes the other and drifts through the other. Um, one example that I'm fond of thinking about is that um, the prairie, uh, you, if you can stand and look out on the prairie, you might actually think about the Atlantic Ocean off the north coast of Guyana. It's flat and it's brown and when you're standing on the seawall uh, on the edge of Georgetown, you might 
look out on, at the Atlantic Ocean. And I did look out onto the Atlantic Ocean and see the prairie. I was like, oh my God, that is the Alberta prairie right there. So it's this way that, that one place can inhabit another. Um, and you never leave a place in a way. You always carry it with you. So the places that you carry with you inhabit the places where you are. Um, so home is always elsewhere. Um, and I, I, I like that, that, that displacement um, of, of, um, of, I like that displacement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ian? Yeah, um, I think I write from places that could be anywhere. Uh, so places that are really diverse and rich and cosmopolitan. And we expect those to be like cities, but in fact, the dream progresses outward into the suburbs. And I like the charm of the suburbs. There's something, I mean, maybe a hundred years ago, there would be something bucolic about it. But right now, there's also some, uh, a bit of a remove from the city that's really kind of alluring, the promise of the suburbs. Um, uh, so, I mean, Reproduction is one book, and it was set in Brampton, but it kind of goes all over the place, too. Um, but yeah, it's that kind of story was only possible in the GTA, right? It couldn't happen, I don't know, in Iowa City, right? It could only happen in a place where people cross from all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the places that I find stimulating. Mm -hmm. I kind of, I tend to agree in a sense. I find a lot of, um, uh, uh, moving to Montreal was, was um, important to me in that it, I was coming to a bigger place than, than Calgary or Vancouver, a place that was much more diverse and where they, it was like a cultural corridor. So people come through from Toronto, from Ottawa. Um, and uh, that same sense of, of diversity and cultural vibrancy uh, is something that is, it, it sparks writing. It makes me want to write. Um. Mm -hmm. um, let, let me ask you th th this question, um, Kai, b b because th th there's a sense of, um, oh, no, let, let, me, let me go this way. We, we've known each other for a while. So, so, so full disclosure, mm -hmm. uh, I think I met you, Kai, in the 1990s when I was working at CKUT, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you eventually took over the program that I used to host, if I remember correctly, Soul Perspectives, yes. uh, back in the 1990s. And that, that, was, a, that was a program that was very much, uh, a show that was very much rooted in community. Uh, it, it was a show that, that, that we, you know, we were trying to produce a radio show, a radio program that, that um, supported the community and, and spoke to the community's needs. And, and, and I want to, to ask you about how you view today, you know, as a writer, your relationship to your community. Well, that's a tough question because, um, you know, and I'm not from, I didn't grow up in Montreal. So I never, I didn't grow up within the black community in Montreal. And so, although I'm very much connected to it because I've been here for so long, um, and I've got, I have relationships with so many people within that community. Um, there's an entirely, there's a deeper level of relationships and connectedness that, that people who have grown up here have to that community. And in a way, sometimes I'm envious of that because um, it's, uh, I think it gives another dimension and depth to their existence and a sense of rootedness. Um, I am, and Montreal is a city that is, and that's just talking about the, Anglophone Black community. So Montreal is a city in which there's a there's a there's a substantial Haitian population and French Caribbean populations. And um, because of language, I mean, I can understand. I'm bilingual, but I don't understand Creole. So it's unfortunately very hard for me to establish relationships within that um, within that community and a network within that community. Um, but I can say something that there is a there there is a lineage of writers here too, and one writer within that community who is a couple of writers who have been very 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 um, uh, generous and and um, kind over the years are of course Nigel Thomas and the novelist and poet Nigel Thomas and um, David Austin as well, whom I've, both of whom I've known for years. I mean, I met other writers here 
who have extended that community out internationally, the dub poet to be young for one, um, who was here when, when you were here as well. And community to you, Ian, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you define your community? Yeah, um, yeah, uh, this is, again, a, a tough question. I'm pretty um, unrooted and kind of unmoored and uh, an immigrant and the child of immigrants. And uh, I, I sort of follow my work around the world, <laughs> um, wherever it takes me. And unrooted too by like familial um, connections and things like that too. And maybe that's part of the sort of liberating thing about kind of uh, that I feel, right? The sense that, oh, this could be home. I could be there. And, you know, I was somewhere in my mid-20s when I it kind of clicked that, you know, you could be at home anywhere in the world, Ian. You could be at home anywhere. It doesn't mean you'd be welcome or accepted. But, like, internally, you would survive um, anywhere. Um, so community, um, I've needed to sort of be kind of... Um, transient right and to sort of sort of make friends and make new friends and to move on and to do all of these things um i don't find it particularly sad but i mean um yeah it would be a very small sort of christmas party i think <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the the one thing though in in reproduction that that, that you you know you're you're you're, you're focusing on is is, is how you know, as individuals, we have agency. We, we have the ability to construct our own communities. We have the ability to construct our own families. Uh, and, and that we are not, we are not, we, we don't have to feel tied to any particular Absolutely. kind of way of being. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we don't need to subscribe to the idea of popularity either, right? That membership in a community, um, in many, in a large community, um, brings with it guaranteed happiness. Uh, maybe it's just one person or a couple of people in your community. Maybe your network stays pretty small. Um, and maybe that's what you need to sort of shore up energy and to protect and to move forward um, successfully. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, there are communities that break down and reform and all of these things. And we have agency in that. We do choose our, um, the people that we wanna be allied with. So. What, what would your character Felicia say about what family means to her and, yeah. and how she's constructed her idea of family. Yeah. She'd say, you know, I didn't plan to have this family. I had no plans to get into this situation with my life, but here I am in it and I'm gonna make the best of it, right? And I think that's the thing that I find really admirable about her, that she survives. Um, and that's a, an underrated virtue, I think, for people of color, it's an underrated virtue generally the act to survive, um, the vicissitudes and the kind of radiation that, that um, we feel. So she survives very quietly. It's not a theatrical show. It's not very dramatic. And you know, in a hundred years in regular life, her identity would be erased under you know, celebrities and everyone else. Um, but she's lived her life well. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's a particularly poignant moment in your book uh, Kai in, in Dominoes at the Crossroads, where you know th there, there's an image of of this enslaved person who is trying to you know escape their captors, and 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 the, the enslaved person recognizes or or comes to terms with the fact that that they're living for the future, really, that 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 that, that they are living really to have their story told by an author like Kai Kello. Um, <laughs> And, and, and it really kind of, it kind of messed with me <laughs> when, I, when, I, when, I, when I read that. That, that, was, that was a very kind of powerful kind of moment in your, in your book. Can you speak to that? I think, yeah, it's, a, it's in a passage where um, I think they, they, they're up in the tree. That's right, they're in the tree. And they know that they're gonna get, uh, that, they're, that they're being pursued and there's a swarm of bats that uh, comes and conceals them from their pursuers. And so what they decide to do is to tell their story to the bats and that the bats can fly off with it and deliver it to others. Um, I, I don't, I, I, I mean, you know, those moments where you, 
where you're reading a story, and I mean, whoever might have written it, but you see a, a kind of spark of recognition there. It could be something that you read by Roberts and Davies that makes you think of a, 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 a visit to Saskatchewan that you might have had at a particular age to visit your father's family, or you know, it can be it can be in, in any work. But those moments of recognition where you feel that um, some of your story might be being told. Um, or might have been told before you came into being, or um, uh, those are incredible moments. And uh, that's one of the remarkable powers of writing that it has. It can connect you that way. It can tell your story before you know you have one. It can help you to construct your own personal story. It can deliver your story to somebody else who didn't even know you had a story to be delivered. Um, and it can also help you recognize that maybe you do indeed have a story that um, that you might you might want to tell. Ian, how do you know where to begin with your stories? Yeah, it sometimes starts with a voice, as with Army's voice, and you know, how are you doing, pretty lady? And sometimes it begins with a, a concept. And because uh, I write poetry too, there's so many beginnings and so many starts that um, there are many places that I can develop from. The thing is the beginning is not always the beginning, right? The beginning is just, um, uh, it might end up in the middle, it might end up not there at all. The beginning is just a kind of mechanism to get you going. Um, and whatever does that in order to get you to discover what the actual story is, is, is worthwhile. And then for you, Kai, how do you know where to start? Uh, there's actually a quote that repeats in a kind of um, like ostinato figure at the beginning of uh, one book, uh, Magnetic Equator, which is uh, a quote from Dion Brand, too much has been made of origins, all origins are arbitrary. And it sort of goes around and around and around. And, it, and I love that idea. I love the idea that there's no, uh, you can never have like a total story because there's always something that precedes the action. And that's one of, I think, the, 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 um, the more kind of fun challenges to cope with when writing, when writing fiction in particular, is where does the story actually begin? And um, what, you know, there's this instinct. One of the things I've learned after writing these uh, uh, books recently was that, um, you know, you can have an instinct to want to do a lot of scene setting and to present a lot of context before the story actually begins. And it's important to have the confidence just to start. Um, and, you know, all kinds of things will reveal themselves to a reader through just the mention of particular places, the ways in which people interact with one another, the types of people they come across and the circumstances they find themselves in. Um, so in a way, uh, it doesn't matter where you begin just so long as you begin, you know? I think it was Toni Morrison who, who said something to the effect that, that you know, in writing fiction, you, you you try to make it seem as if it's easy, but 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 we know that it's it's not easy. And, and I'm curious about some of the kind of difficult decisions that the two of you had to make in writing the you know writing your stories. What are some decisions that that you lost sleep over? You know, Ian, can can you address right. that? What, what were some of the kind of tough right. things that you really had to kind of yeah contemplate? Well, in reproduction, definitely the form kept me up at night um, and how to sort of write a very introverted character, right? How does Felicia sustain an entire novel? But in word problems, it was different. And my challenge to myself was I wanted to write a book where every poem was different from uh, other poems in there, right? Um, and then I was like, but I actually don't want to write just the standard lyric poem anymore. I actually wanted to do something else. Um, and so I created this kind of shell that is neither poem nor fiction. It exists in the space of situation instead. And so the book is peppered with these ideas, these situations that people then work through. And Kai, for you? Well, I mean, fiction is, 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 is really complex. It's, it's, you know, let's say that you are writing the Montreal Metro and you, you are writing the Metro, reading a book, and you look over and there's somebody else who's reading a book who's looking at you and you're thinking about simultaneously about where you have to go next about what's happening in the book and about this person who's looking at you and they're thinking about all of the same things and how do you communicate that in writing I mean, where do you begin 
what do you say first in order to set up that you, do we talk about the setting where they are, they're on the Metro, or I was reading my book and then when I looked up, or do you talk about what's going on in your head and what you're thinking about? Or do you talk about what's happening in the book? And in life, so many things happen. There's so many narratives happening at once that uh, it's it sometimes even to describe a really common everyday scene, it becomes extremely complex. And those kinds of, of really practical moments always, um, they're always, I always find those cha very challenging in fiction. Mm -hmm. We have a question here from the audience, and, and the question is from AM. Uh, the question from Facebook, the question is, has the pandemic shifted how you both reimagine the idea of home or, rooted, or rootedness? <laughs> has the pandemic shifted that, apart from like confining us to our homes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, spend a lot of time here. I mean, the odd thing is I was, I was playing tennis earlier today. Um, and I thought, you know, I couldn't do this in the pre-pandemic world. I would actually have been in Ottawa right now. Um, and then I would have to go to Newfoundland after that. And so uh, a lot of time would be spent traveling. And the world is sort of, it's, it's a bit cliche to say that the world has shrunk or something like that. Um, but we kind of zip around our virtual selves with more ease than we did eight months ago, right? Or six months ago. And that means we're getting used to the idea of ourselves being um, little boxes or something. We're becoming something else, right? The other parts of our identity, like your social media identity has been pretty intact, but now we've got this kind of um, proxy identity that we've worked out. Here's my house, right? <laughs> Everything you need to know about my house back here. Um, and I need to dress from like this much up. So yeah, the, the pandemic has kind of, shifted my sense of self a little bit, yeah. And also made me rethink about what my home can do and what it is. And now you would never see this if I were in Ottawa, um, but I think I would prefer to be in Ottawa with you. <laughs> Kai? I think it has, um, it's created a, 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 a more immediate perhaps sense of, of for me, of, of how, how connected we are the world just you know a person can who has the coronavirus can jump on a flight and and expose other people and those people will go to wherever they are destined and expose yet others and it's a created it's i think it's an, it's also an opportunity for a kind of um empathy because you can see a, a massive outbreak happening in italy or in um i don't know in in, in, in somewhere else some other distant place in the world and you can understand really some of the struggles and tensions that those people are facing and um you know some of the challenges of their home become yours uh, you carry them with you as well and so there's that there's that there's that sense of home becoming um sense of home is suddenly even though it's it's shrunk i think to this to the size of this screen because we're always on the screens now um it's uh it's also expanded in a way um to to include others one thing that the two of you carry uh, with you and, and it's certainly evident in your in your work is is the caribbean um you know ian you you were born in trinidad uh you know kai you you have roots in in, in guyana what 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 role does this, this the caribbean play in in your kind of literary imagination kai uh well I wasn't born in Guyana, and so I do have, but I have a, um, I guess, an awareness of Guyana. It, it was always this remarkable elsewhere that was that was discussed in the family, where, where you know things happened a little bit differently, and it was this mythical place, right? It had this rainforest. My name was connected to indigenous histories and mythology. Um, it, it produced these incredible writers like Martin Carter and A.J. Seymour and Grace Nichols and Wilson Harris at political... Yan, Yan Carew. Yan Carew, yes. Mm -hmm. um, Walter Rodney, you know, and it was um, a place that produced my grandparents, uh, my mom's, my mom's uh, siblings, my mom, where people spoke differently from how they spoke here, where... Um, uh, you know, it, 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 it was um, 
I guess almost like a mythical place in a way, um, a fantastical place. And uh, it was also a place where I had potentially another self, or one that that would, or I had the possibility of finding another self if I went to that place. Um, and that was, you know, when I was growing up, when I was much younger, that was sort of the way I thought about it. It was a sort of boyish um, way of looking at it. And Ian, for you, the Caribbean. Yeah, so I, I was a kid in the, in Trinidad, and so my um, associations with Trinidad are like a little childish, right? You know, I could think about, oh, here's a good snack place, and you know, you know, uh, here's your school uniform, but I wouldn't tell you how to get a driver's license or get a job in, in Trinidad. I can tell you like really sophisticated adult things about it, um, but it does occupy um, that kind of elsewhere space that that Kai was talking about, and. I think about it the way that I think about the time of my birth. So I was born in 1979. So I caught just the tail end of the 70s with all of that sort of disco emerging and with really sort of um, like black power movements and just all of that. And I feel like saying I was born in 1979 is actually significant from saying like I was born in 1980, right? Those things mean very different things for me, although it's just a year apart. And so I feel like Trinidad too has that kind of thing in my head, although, you know, Canada is, is home. Trinidad is that space. Trinidad is closer to South America than it is to North America, but it's in the stretch of ocean, so you can't really tell. And so from the beginning, I felt partly like South American and partly just in the, from nowhere in particular, much like Felicia, and then um, Canadian. So yeah, it allows me to be from the beginning to have a template of like flexibility stamped on me, right? That you will always be um, from an indeterminate place, right? Hard to determine. Mm -hmm. I think for, for me also though, when I think about the things that I've, I've, I've um, been exposed to in Caribbean culture and drawn from and learned from, I think that what it's, what it's given me is a kind of richness and a resilience that uh, in order to, that's allowed me to survive and persevere as an artist here in North America, especially starting at a time when our voices weren't heard as much. And, um, I would say that a, a great deal of the of the of my sensibility as a writer, my aesthetic sensibility comes from an engagement with Guyanese culture and Caribbean culture, um, an ongoing engagement with that. I was born in 1975, um, so I think of that like smack in the middle of of, of the reggae years, um, before you know um, horn sections disappeared and 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 electronic keyboards came in and replaced them, but the roots. Um, and uh, I love the sound from that period. Um, and that's something that, that uh, you know, stays with me all the time, that, that, that um, kind of awareness of and thinking about the Caribbean, especially thinking about the sound of the Caribbean from a particular time. Um, yeah. yeah, 75 was also the time when the, when, when the West Indies was excelling in cricket. Huh? Huh? Yeah, my know. dad would love that, huh? right? Huh? There was, there was, a, there was a, Vivian Richards and Malcolm <laughs> yeah. Marshall and Joel Garner and, and all the all all the like. Well, it, you know, it's it's eight fifty eight, and and unfortunately, I think we've come to the end of, of really a fabulous conversation with, with Kai Kello and and Ian Williams. Uh, I'd like to thank you both for for being so generous with your time uh, this evening and, and for also gifting us with with these wonderful books of yours. Uh, Reproduction by Ian Williams, which won the 2019 Aguilar Prize. Uh, Dominoes at the Crossroads, which we're cheering for uh, to win the, the 2020 uh, Aguilar Prize by, by Kai Kello. Uh, so thank you both. Thank you so much for, for, for joining us this evening. Uh, and also thank you to the Ottawa Writers Festival for, for convening this uh, and also the, the Ottawa Public Library and Library and Archives Canada also played a role. Uh, and thank you to you, our audience, for being so attentive. Thank you for sharing your, your questions and, and your comments over the course of the last uh, 90 minutes. We do appreciate it. We encourage you to continue to support the Ottawa Writers Festival, a festival that is really an institution in the city of Ottawa and has done so much to enrich the cultural life here. We also want to encourage you to buy books Buy as many books as you can for, and support independent bookstores, not just here in Ottawa, uh, but across the country. So thanks again uh, for joining us and we'll see you very soon. Have a good evening.